1 to 16 in the New Testament, reading from the New Revised Standard Version. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, and then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. And if you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right. For we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then whenever you have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Now you see what large letters I make when I'm writing in my own hand? It is to those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they might boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy, and upon the house of Israel of God. May God have his blessing to this, the hearing of his word. Let all of God's people say amen. Amen. This particular scripture reading from Galatians chapter 6, there are other versions, of course, other interpretations, other and one of them comes from the message, which is what I normally have for our opening our call to worship for the Psalter reading this morning that comes from the message, which is sort of a transliteration, not so much a translation. The message lifts up to live creatively. And if somebody falls into sin, forgivingly restore them, saving your critical comments for yourself. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed and share their burden. If you think you're too good for that, you are badly deceived. And do not be impressed with yourself. Do not compare yourself with others. Each of us must take responsibility for doing the best we can with our own life. And in that phrase about writing in the bold scrawls of my own personal handwriting the immense importance of what i've written to you is how it's phrased be very sure of what we do and how we do it and in the translation called god's word it says brothers and sisters if a person gets trapped by wrongdoing those of you who are more spiritual should help that person to turn away from what is doing wrong, but to do it in a gentle way. At the same time, watch yourself so that you are also not tempted. Each of us must examine our own actions, assuming our own responsibility. Plant whatever you plant, and it will be harvested. Which goes back to our children's message. If we want flowers, we do not plant tomatoes. But often we, as human beings, we make a big deal out of things, don't we? 
sometimes too many things. I would be amiss if I did not tell you that this week has been challenging for me. And I've thought about our passage today in relationship to my own self and what has been revealed by the experts, by the doctors. A heart valve that's not functioning correctly, but you can't see it. I can't see it. I can sort of feel it. I can sort of know that something's going on, but I didn't know and I don't know exactly what it is. Other than going to the, quote, experts, the doctors, the cardiologists. In a similar vein, I've thought about this with our sin as human beings. We have a feeling that something's not quite right. All of us do. We sense that something is maybe broken. Something's not working quite right. But we don't know what it is. We can't really see it. But we sense its presence. We know it. Scripture talks about this as sin. That is our willingness to do that which is counter to our Creator, to our God, to our King. Counter to the kingdom itself. To do what is selfish, what we want, and not what God wants. But we are often unable to see this. We get unclear messages at times, even from ourselves. And most particularly, unclear messages from the world around us. I'll give you an example of this unclear, unclear clarity. You know what I'm talking about. That. Yeah, it's just unclear. I read a story recently about a couple of gas company service people. They were working together. One was a senior training supervisor. The other one was a younger trainee. And they were out checking meters around the neighborhood. Parked their truck at the end of the alley and worked their way to the other end. When we got to the other end, the last house that they were checking for their meters, a woman nearby just happened to look out her kitchen window as the two were checking her gas meter. And she just kind of watched them like people do. As they got done checking it, the senior supervisor looked at the younger one and felt a bit ornery and challenged the younger one to a foot race back to the pickup truck through the alley to see whether or not the younger one could outrun the older one. And he wasn't that much older, but he was older enough. So he figured he could, he could maybe do it. So off they took, running at full speed, running down towards the truck. And just as they about got to the truck, they realized that they weren't alone. The lady was with them, right next to them. And they slowed up when they got up to the truck, and they turned and they looked at the lady, and they asked her, what are you doing? Why are you running? As they were all three gasping. And she replied, listen, when I see two gas men running as fast as they can, I figure I can run too. <laughs> our message from our God and from our King, from the Old Testament throughout the New Testament, from the pulpits over the decades and centuries are sometimes not as clear as they need to be. Or if they are clear, we don't quite understand what's going on. Give you another a very personal example that Chris and I ran into here just a few weeks ago. You know that we were able to travel to Savannah, Georgia with some friends, and we experienced Savannah, Georgia, and I would offer that up for a trip. If anybody has not been there, it's a beautiful area. But one of the things in downtown Savannah that we discovered was the first house that had electricity in near one of the parks. When they were getting ready to turn on the electricity to this very first house in Savannah, Georgia, no one understood electricity back then. They were pretty suspicious of it. They doubted it greatly. So much so that dozens and dozens, perhaps even hundreds, if not a few thousand people, gathered together around this, this house to watch the electricity turned on. Not because they wanted to see the electricity turned on, because they all anticipated expected it to blow up. Well, it didn't happen. And I wonder sometimes if the people who see us in the church wonder if we are going to blow up as 
as well because they don't understand what we're doing. They don't understand what we are about. And we ourselves don't at times. Or if we do, we are misguided. There was a story as well that I read about a man who fell overboard on a luxury liner. He began to call out for help as he was beginning to drown. The first person to respond was a person that was a moralist. And when he saw the man had fallen overboard, he reached for his briefcase, pulled out a book on how to swim, and tossed it to him. And told him to read the instructions on how to swim. Well, there was another one, thankfully. There was an idealist nearby as well that saw the man fall into the water. He jumped into the water, began to swim towards him, but only so far. And he stayed away from him and said, do as I do, you're going to be all right. But he wouldn't get anywhere close to him. And then, of course, there was the individual that was an institutional church kind of person, looked at the drowning person's plight with great concern and heartache, yelled out, we will establish a committee and we will dialogue about the problem. And we will see if we can come up with some financing to resolve the situation. And then, of course, there was the positive thinking individual who yelled back to the drowning man, Dear friend, it's not nearly as bad as you think. Just think dry. But thankfully, prayerfully, there was the realist who jumped into the water, risking their own life and saving the drowning man. We need to be realists, not these other things that we often pretend to be. There was a lot of work to do. We need to be planting seeds of hope, love, care, without judgment. We need to be planting love and not waiting for somebody or something to happen. The bulk of Jesus' ministry in the world that we read in Scripture was about healing people. Healing them first. And then helping them understand how to make the changes needed in their lives that needed to be made. Our world is inundated with so-called fake news where we like to gather around our internet feeds, our coffee houses, whatever they might be, to gather news from the communities that we feel most comfortable with. And we pass on misinformation, <clears throat> news that really isn't real news. It's what's been termed in our terminology today in our culture as fake news. And we know, don't we? It depends on what group you're talking to. They begin to believe this piece of news because it came from that particular source. And then all of a sudden you find out a day or two later that that's not the case at all. It doesn't seem to matter what direction it comes from either, does it? Whether or not it's a so-called liberal, progressive, conservative end of the spectrum, it doesn't make any difference. So many of us jump to conclusions. So many of us don't seem to care about others as much as we care about our agenda, whatever that agenda might be, and how sad that is to us and for us, isn't it? I frankly don't care sometimes what a person believes. If they're drowning, I'm going to jump in and save them. Aren't you? Or are you going to wait and try to discern whether or not they're the right kind of person to save? Or are you going to say, you know what, they need help? You know, we started out the service during the, during the announcements about the food pantry. Are we going to wait and have them fill out a form about whether or not they deserve a meal? Or are we going to provide a meal for them because they're hungry? Are we going to have them fill out a form before we give them some clothing to keep them warm at night or at length? Or are we
we going to simply provide the blanket and the clothing for them? Because they need it. And worry about the other things later if need be. But at the moment, help each other. Isn't that what we are supposed to be about as the church? This past week, the mortality that I have has hit me upside the head. It's still beginning to sink in. Now I knew I was mortal. But this is more than just a theory. Now I've got doctors telling me, you know, you got something inside of you that's not working right. We're going to have to go in there and fix it. And it's going to take a while for this to be repaired and restored to its original purpose and the way it's supposed to work. That takes a whole different viewpoint than what I had before. Fixing the problem? Let's save people first. You're going to have an opportunity later on today to gather around maybe the tables in the other room, the round tables, and to discuss news, ideas, thoughts, whatever they might be. Well, we do this in our world. Small towns I've lived in over the years, the co-op was often the place where people would gather. Small towns, really small towns, particularly this, where they always would. They bring in the corn and the beans, and then they would have their coffee hour, or two, or three, and figure out all the problems of the world and get them all sorted out as they debated and argued about why corn is so low or why beans went so high, and so on and so forth. You know what I'm talking about. But for us in our common culture now, it's going to be perhaps Starbucks or Caribou or whatever kind of a coffee shop it is. Here at so it's going to be not just a cold, maybe a the American Legion up the way. Or Big Grove right over here. Wherever it is we gather, we're going to talk about things. But when we do, as followers of Christ, when we as followers of Christ together, may we talk together with care, with gentleness, and with patience, knowing that each and every one of us, in some way, are broken. Each and every one of us, in some way, we know we have some things to do. We know there needs to be some Corrective behavior or attitude done, but we don't know quite how to do it. But we know it. And so does your neighbor and friend. Help each other. That's why God brought us together as his people, as his children, as his brothers and sisters, to help each other. Help one another, please.